Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexis Roos, and at Salesforce, I lead a team of data scientists and engineers focusing on building intelligent services from activity data. And today, Sami and I will discuss how we use Spark to build our services. This presentation will cover some future developments, and Salesforce, being a publicly traded company, have to remind you to only make purchasing decisions based on products that are commercially available today. From an agenda standpoint, I will briefly introduce Salesforce. I will then set up the stage for the rest of the presentation by explaining our problem space. And from there, we will discuss some of the main elements of a pricing request classifier pipeline that we are building, which include labeling, training, and scoring. And Sami will do the bulk of the presentation uh, along those lines. Salesforce offers a comprehensive and customer success platform that allows our users to offer a unique customer experience. We are thrilled with the success we have achieved together with our partners and customers, and are proud to have been called innovator of the decade, and NEM, one of the Fortune's best place to work nine years in a row. We are especially proud of how our customers are innovating, disrupting market, developing new business models, and helping contribute billions uh, in GDP and millions of jobs. Our customer success platform is the world's number one CRM and covers a spectrum of users' interactions from sales, marketing, service, commerce, community, and capabilities with IoT, applications, and analytic cl clouds. Over the last few years, Salesforce has embarked into adding AI right into our platform and applications to deliver the world's smartest CRM. And we have made over $6 million uh, investments in companies related to intelligence ranging from analytics to machine learning to deep learning. The goal for us is to use our customer data and deep understanding of our customer experience to embed intelligence across all our applications through the Einstein Initiative. Uh, this afternoon, we will give a preview of what we're doing in the sales cloud, specifically for our inbox product. Uh, in the first section, I will show a quick video of the inbox product and discuss the email data that we are using for essentially building uh, our classifier. Oops. Trying to make PowerPoint work on that, which is not displaying the same. Okay, I might play the video in a browser then, uh, which might make that easier actually for you guys to see. Salesforce Inbox streamlines your sales workflow so you can spend more time connecting with customers and closing deals. Surface relevant CRM data like leads, contacts, and opportunities on every email to help you craft the perfect response. Then update your pipeline in real time so your forecast is always up to date. Prioritize your day with suggested tasks and make sure nothing slips through the cracks with intelligent reminders. Use Salesforce email templates and cloud integrations like Salesforce files and box to keep okay. the... Okay, sorry about that. So it's not displaying on the second screen or is it playing now? Okay, okay, sorry, we're gonna replay that then. Salesforce Inbox streamlines your sales workflow so you can spend more time connecting with customers and closing deals. Surface relevant CRM data like leads, contacts, and opportunities on every email to help you craft the perfect response. Then update your pipeline in real time so your forecast is always up to date. Prioritize your day with suggested tasks and make sure nothing slips through the cracks with intelligent reminders. Use Salesforce email templates and cloud integrations like Salesforce files and box to keep deals moving forward. And when you click send, easily log sales activities so your team always has contacts to help on a deal. Shorten your sales cycle by using dynamic scheduling to book customer meetings faster and share your availability to find a meeting time with one email. Prepare for every customer call with 360 degree contact profiles filled with intelligent insights so you can anticipate customer needs. When you follow up, monitor customer engagement with email tracking to get notifications that inform next steps. And once the deal closes, connect directly to the Salesforce One mobile app to update status. Sell smarter and faster with Inbox from Salesforce.
So Salesforce Inbox is targeted at CRM users, and as such, we can build data products that are particularly useful to sales teams. Salespeople receive a wide variety of emails and have to quickly sort out and act upon on some emails in a timely fashion. Some of them are very relevant, while others are not. And we will show that what we are essentially looking at accomplishing here is getting uh, to, to uh, essentially being able to extract those uh, significant emails. So the model we're discussing and we are building is specifically looking for requests for information about pricing. For instance, we can see on the left that the email is about pricing request, while the other two are not. And essentially, our model are about identifying those spe specific moments. So let's start discussing the classifier pipeline, which will cover labeling, feature generation, and also scoring. Our labeling pipeline has a filtering step, step prior to shipping data off to the labelers using our in-house labeling tool. Uh, this involves a number of steps uh, that we will not be discussing today, including, for instance, using GraphX to filter emails, such as mass emails or marketing emails. In the presentation, we'll zoom in into the some of the segments we're doing here, like using word to vec to filter down our own data. So our data set contains billions of emails. Uh, as we're doing you know, supervised learning, we have to be able to label some of those emails. And so we have some uh, internal emails you know, that we can use as a grand truth and that are essentially anonymized and they have, we have explicit permission to label. So looking at what a typical email might look like, we see that it contains you know, several parts, including introduction, body, signature, confidential notice, and reply chain, and at times, you know, some or none of them. And we usually care about the body portion of the email, as we will discuss in the subsequent slides, and we're using that to extract signal out of it. And now we let, you know, uh, Sami do the bulk of the presentation and explain the labeling pipeline and uh, feature generation and scoring. Thank you. So there are a number of challenges with our data set. The first is that we have no labels for our data. And we also have no mechanism to infer labels or collect labels somehow. The next challenge is that pricing requests are very important events, but they're also extremely rare. Only a small fraction of emails are actually requests for pricing. And lastly, emails are sensitive. So we can't simply mechanical turk them. There's not that many people who uh, can sign an NDA and actually label these emails. So with all these problems, this means that hand labeling is actually really impractical because we'd have to label tons and tons and tons of emails with only a small team of labelers and only in order to get enough positive examples. So a big question is how can we get a higher yield of positive labels when we're labeling by hand? Here's some synthetic data that we've generated in order to help illustrate this idea. So here you can see that there are a lot more negative labels than positive labels. What if we're able to zoom in on the region of space around the positive labels? So if we think of this green circle as the decision boundary for a classifier, then we can say that this classifier has really high recall. In some situations, it might be really difficult to separate the positive and negative labels, but significantly easier to build a high recall classifier, which we can then use as a filter. Uh, with this, labelers can look only at points inside the green circle. So how do we actually go about building this green circle? The first component in our solution was to build a relationship graph, and the second utilized WordDevac. And today we're going to focus on how we used WordDevac in order to build this filter. So WordDevac is a neural network model that takes in a collection of text documents and produces a high dimensional vector space with each word in your corpus living somewhere in this vector space. Word vectors are positioned such that words that appear in similar context will appear close to each other in this space. So in this example we have right here, we're looking at the word cost uh, in three different documents and looking at the context around it. Words such as total and seats and money might frequently appear in the context surrounding our token word cost. You can imagine that other words, such as price, will likely appear in a context similar to the word cost. 
And so the word vectors for price and cost, we would expect to be close to one another. So what we did is we trained word devec on unlabeled emails and then used it to find words close in distance to things like price and cost and license. Once we had a set of similar words, we more or less retained emails that contain one of those words. So fast forwarding a bit to the present day, which is long after we initially trained word devec, we actually now have some label data and we were able to go back and evaluate the performance of this filter that we built. The first thing we learned is that our original data set only contained 0.17% positive labels. Combining graph, our graph-based approach, and word devec reduced our data set to 2% of its original size and increased the positive label rate to 11.2% with a recall of 0.93. So we've introduced some bias, which is ev evidenced by the fact that recall is less than one. However, hand labeling is now tractable because we actually get around 11% positive labels instead of uh, almost a tenth of a percent. So while training word devec, we discovered some ways that we could process the input that would dramatically improve our results. Let's zoom in just on the body of this email. It contains names, a dollar amount, and a phone number. The problem with these values, though, is that they're noisy. And to illustrate what I mean, here's the result of training word devec on our corpus of emails and looking at the top five synonyms of the word cost. <coughs> As you can see, we have a bunch of dollar amounts in our list of close word vectors. In a way, this is encouraging because it makes a lot of sense, but at the same time, if we wanna build a high recall filter, a list of dollar amounts is fairly brittle. You can imagine that if we wanted to score a new document and it contained a dollar amount that wasn't represented in our training set, there wouldn't be a word vector for it and that's not good. So the main insight here in order to solve this problem is that we don't actually care what the names of the individuals are, and we also don't really care what the precise monetary values are. We just care that they exist. So we normalized names, dollar amounts, phone numbers, and other such values to a single unique token per category. When we retrain word devec using this normalized corpus, we get much better results. So you can see that our token for money appears in the list of synonyms, as do many other words that look pretty sensible. Another trick that we did was we interleaved n-grams with the body text and then expanded the context window used for training word devec accordingly. Those of you familiar with word devec might know that computing n-grams prior to training generally isn't recommended as it doesn't really improve the learned word vectors. However, we included both unigrams and n-grams for a very specific reason it allows us to find n-grams that are close in distance to unigrams. So here's what we get when we retrain word devec with this augmented corpus. As you can see, some of the n-gram word vectors are quite nice, and they give a signal that we wouldn't be able to get with unigrams alone. Uh, you can see, as for example, month to month uh, is clearly something that would be associated with a, a request for pricing, but the word month on its own definitely wouldn't be. So let's now jump into discussing how we generated features for this pricing model. We have a pipeline for generating feature vectors and training models, and today we're gonna to focus on how we use LDA to generate a piece of this feature vector. <coughs> so LDA is an algorithm that takes a collection of documents and seeks to group them by topic, where a topic is a probability distribution over words. Here are some example topics that you could get after running LDA on Wikipedia articles. The words you're seeing in each topic are that, that topic's top five most probable words. So we basically took the probability distribution, sort it, uh, and then take the top five words. And this is courtesy of Databricks. Uh, now, LDA models each document as a probability distribution over topics. And so when we go to score a new document, what we get back is a distribution over topics. For instance, if we wanted to score a Wikipedia article about Boeing, we would likely get back a probability distribution composed primarily of topics four and five. And similarly, if we were to score a Wikipedia article about Air Force One, we would probably get back a probability distribution with weights heavily in topics one and five. So LDA does have some limitations. Since it's an unsupervised algorithm, you can't really select topics you want to identify in advance. And you also can't know what the topics are. 
topics are just distributions. So this means you can't simply run LDA to identify emails assigned to the pricing topic because you can't know which topic is pricing and you can't even guarantee that uh, LDA will even find a pricing topic at all. So what we did instead is we included the entire topic distribution in the feature vector. And the idea behind this is that if LDA does identify a pricing topic, then when we go train a supervised model, the, the feature corresponding to the pricing topic will get weighted as important. And if uh, LDA doesn't find a pricing topic, maybe some other combination of topics combined kind of looks like pricing. And so we would expect a supervised model to uh, discover that that combination of topics is useful. So like with WordEvec, we found ways to pre-process our data so that LDA does a better job of identifying topics. If we look at the structure of an email again, there are many components that can hinder the quality of the LDA model. So the intro and the signature basically look the same for every email that's ever been sent. Emails start with hello so-and-so, and then there's a body, and at the end you say thank you and sign your name, or regards and sign your name. Uh, similarly, uh, confidentiality notices, uh, which is something that salespeople apparently get a lot of emails containing confidentiality notices, and that's basically just a disclaimer at the bottom that says, you know, this email is meant to go to the intended recipient. Uh, if this wasn't meant for you, please delete it. Uh, the kind of thing you'll, you'll get at the bottom of like an email from your bank. So these are generally the same kind of legalese, and uh, there's really not that much different between them. And so when you have components of an email, such as an intro and a signature and a confidentiality notice that are common across all the emails, then they sort of blend the emails together in topic space, and it makes your topics kind of like harder to separate out. The next uh, issue with emails is reply chains. Now, reply chains have a couple of problems. The first is that each subsequent reply is a different email, and that email has its own set of topics. And so when you have uh, re reply text at the bottom of each email, then you're effectively adding more, to more topics to your email, which makes it harder to discern topics. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, you can imagine, like let's say you have a chain with 10 emails in it. The first email that you send will appear in your corpus as an email. It'll also appear in your corpus as a reply to a different email, and it'll also appear in your corpus as a reply to every single email in the chain. So for a chain of length 10, the first email in that chain gets represented 10 times. So you're effectively oversampling long email chains, and specifically early ones in that chain. So if we remove all those sections and leave just the body, it significantly helps separate the topic clusters in the topic space. So as an example of one issue we ran into before we actually did this, uh, we've identified sort of like sent from my iPhone as a topic, which you know, makes a lot of sense, but it also is not very useful for us. We don't really care. So removing that helped a lot. So we have some things in the works in order to further improve the performance of these models. The first is to investigate alternative methods for computing n-gram word vectors. There's a lot of work out there on combining word to vec word vectors. Since they are, in fact, vectors, you can do math with them. Uh, and there have been a lot of proposed solutions to create, say, a summary uh, sentence word vector, a sentence vector by, say, averaging word vectors together or using an inner product. Uh, there's a lot of research out there, and it's worth investigating alternatives to what we've done here. Another thing that we can do is now that we were able to bootstrap and actually get some labeled data, we can use that labeled data to train a model and tune it to have very high recall and use this as our high recall filter. And we'll actually get an idea of precisely what our bias is if we know the recall. And the last thing is once we have a feedback system incorporated into, into our UI, We'll want to factor in user feedback in order to generate labels, which will be especially important since the positive label is so rare. So let's move on to the last bit, which is scoring new emails. We have a real-time scoring pipeline using structured streaming that another team at Salesforce is building. And the scoring pipeline is pretty straightforward. Uh, we read in data from Kafka, we apply the high recall filter that we've discussed, and then we generate features and score them. The code is quite straightforward as well. 
So we use Spark ML's pipelines and we combine them using basic Scala constructs. We have one pipeline for generating ungrams and another pipeline for generating the LDA topic distribution. Uh, we then use Vector Assembler, which is that, that last transform you see at the bottom. And all it does is it takes the, the ngram feature vector and the LDA one and just stacks them on top of each other. Then we convert the emails to feature vectors and then we use our model to score them. So now I'll show you a quick demo of our scoring pipeline at Databricks. So this first cell loads the model, the next one loads the data, and then, oops. Hopefully this runs. All right. So you can see here, here are emails. And on the right, you can see we have a score. It's quite simple. So now I'd like to summarize some of the lessons that we've learned while working on this problem. When faced with an unlabeled data set and positive labels represent rare events, a high recall filter is something that might help you out a lot because sometimes high recall filters are something that you can build without labels and it won't be too hard and it'll make it a lot easier for you to get positive labels uh, with, that you can then uh, label later. Uh, the trade-off here is that you are introducing some bias by adding a high recall filter, but in our case, if we didn't do this, the problem would have been a complete non-starter. And so this allowed us to make progress on this problem. When training word -vec, normalizing names, monetary values, and other groups of words to a single token greatly improved the relevance of learned word vectors. Also in the context of word -vec, Interleaving ngrams with unigrams gave us an API that let us query for close ngrams using a unigram seed. We also learned that filtering out content that's common to all documents and just looking at the body helped LDA discern topics. Reply chains effectively oversample long threads, and so filtering them out eliminated this oversampling. And lastly, SparkML's pipelines have several nice properties. You can encapsulate every step of your data processing and model training process uh, inside of a pipeline. You can serialize that pipeline and read it back. Uh, and pipelines can be easily combined in Scala. So, thank you for your time and attention. And we'll be happy to take questions. And as the slide says, we're hiring, right? So data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers. You have a question? Come talk to us. How are you validating that you got the right number of LDA topics? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so I think probably the best way to do that is uh, cross-validation. So Spark makes it really easy to, so Spark's cross-validator accepts a, a pipeline and so you can have LDA, uh, train, the training of LDA as a part of your pipeline, and you can make the number of LDA topics uh, your parameter. And since the whole reason we're using LDA is to uh, create part of our feature vector to, for a supervised model, we, the number of topics is selected based on which one helps the performance of the model. Question on uh, memory consumption in Spark when gen training the Vortivic model, did you face any challenges while trying to create the model over a large corpus? Two, um, 
the dimensions, the vector dimensions of the Vortec model. Can you talk a bit more about it for the accurate matching? I'm not sure I heard that, actually. Do you think yeah, you could repeat can that? You, yeah, can you please yeah. rephrase the question? The vector size, like, did you use um, vector dimension beyond 300 for um, alpha tuning a Vortec model? I'm actually having trouble hearing you. Do you think you speak a little louder into the mic? Oh, OK. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Well, number one is, did you face any challenge in creating the model with respect to the memory consumption in Spark? Two is, can you talk about the vector dimension that you use for the Vortec model? Sure. So, so no, we didn't really get you know issues there because we can run large clusters, and from a war to vex standpoint, we're also running you know global you know data set, right? So we can run on much larger data sets like in the tens of millions, hundred millions. So we didn't really have any performance you know considerations, and uh, but we given and, and f but for the war to vex, I think we probably chose a few hundred. I can remember if it was one hundred or three hundred. But keep in mind that we're only using the war to vex for uh, the high recall filtering. We're not using that for the pipeline itself. So at some point, you know, the, the dimension matters, but doesn't matter as much. On the clustering for the LDA, it sounds like you didn't have as much control. And other times I've done high grade clustering. So if you, you know, do a first pass LDA, and then if there's some topics that are more interesting, more predictive, I wonder, just brainstorming, if it makes sense to do more of a subclustering within those um, to get finer grain LDA clusters in the ones that are predictive, and then maybe that would help. Possibly, so, yes. Just kind yeah. of an adaptive yeah. level of detail. No, possibly there are probably optimization we can do, right? And like, oh, we combine models and ensemble and like uh, sub like uh, making even more honey. We haven't investigated that yet. As I say, it's just like a basically a kind of a kind of search on the side of the cluster. What we've seen, though, is that LDA definitely helps, like uh, the, the model at large. I think LDA really adds a lot of signal, which kind of makes sense, right? Because on one hand, you have like, you know, the engram, the world to vec kind of low locality, but in eventually looking at the, the entire you know, distribution of world in the document really adds signal. Hi. Um, on email body extraction, uh, some email clients will actually put the, the reply thread above the signature, sometimes below. So it's not always as, as clear as, as what you presented. So I'm wondering uh, what you actually did to extract the body. Did you use uh, some heuristics or regular expressions or something more sophisticated? So uh, I think I heard part of that. I, I think you're asking if, uh, like, what we use to actually extract the body. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Uh, yes. uh, uh, reply chain. The, how, how do we identify the reply chain? Yeah, the, the reply chain sometimes is before or after the signature, depending on the email clients. Oh, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think it was a combination of looking at the HTML, because the, the HTML form of the, of the email, uh, off, depending on the client, will actually have a section, uh, like, like a div that's labeled as the reply chain. And in that case, it's, it's super easy. Like, there's not much work for us to do. Um, that does, that's not always the case with every email client. I think the email clients, I guess at least the ones we encountered that happened to put the reply text in the beginning, we got lucky and they were removed from the div, using a div. Uh, and everything that we had, like other heuristics for, happened to be at the end. Did, did you try to do anything with uh, reusing emails from the same users to like do a diff between all the emails from a single sender or something like that? To, so that the, the difference would be possibly the, the email body um, in order to rem I, I, remove I, I, the common... It's, it's sorry, it's difficult to hear. Oh, if you can sorry. pick up, it's yeah. really hard to, to hear talk from closer. <laughs> um, did you ever try to, to do um, using multiple emails from the same sender to extract the common parts that would be signature? Um, I see. So are, are you asking, like, did we look across emails and try yeah, to use yeah. that in order to identify yes. reply chains? Yeah. Um, that would be a thing that we would do if uh, our method didn't already work, I guess. But uh, we happen to do a pretty good job without that. But yes, that would be a really good way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason why we didn't go down that road initially is because it requires looking at global data, and that's a lot more expensive than looking at each email one at a time. 
and we were able to filter out reply chains without needing to look at global information. Yeah, uh, they, yeah. yeah. there were also a few heuristics involved, and the first label uh, data that we did uh, for some of the models, we essentially added a label which was, you know, kind of badly formatted, and so we looked at all the extraction and made sure, you know, that the recall was very high, that we improved, you know, for instance, some of the edge cases in like yeah, signature parsing, extracting the signature, or, extra, or actually uh, dealing with the reply chain. So we looked at that through, essentially, all the data that's been labeling, uh, labeled. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, um, I think we're good until the next session in about 10 minutes. Thank you.